The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello, and welcome hey. to the Healthcare Facilities Network. Thank you for clicking on this video. As always, happy you've done so. I'd like to uh, introduce my guest today, who may be a familiar face to many of you because he has been in healthcare facilities for quite some time. My guest is Dennis Smith. Dennis, welcome to the Healthcare Facilities Network. Thank you. I appreciate it. So as you may know, Dennis has written a book, which is what we are going to talk about. It's a leadership book, which we will talk about um, in this particular episode. And Dennis is well equipped to write about leadership. He's been a leader in his own company in construction. He has been a leader in the military. He has been a leader for healthcare systems. He's now a leader for his own consulting company as he continues his career in healthcare facilities management. So well situated to talk about leadership. Dennis, before we talk about leadership, can you give um, our viewers who may not know, I mean, you're a familiar face at the ASHI conferences, you've worked across the country, but for our listeners who may not be familiar with a little bit of your career, could you give a little bit of your career background and kind of all those experiences that have led you to write your book that you have recently published? And it is called The Velvet Glove of, Le the Velvet Glove of Leadership in the 2020s. Leadership principles that don't change in a changing world. Great title. What? Uh, tell us though a little bit before we get to that. Tell us a little bit about your leadership background, if you don't mind. Well, you talked about my construction company, and I, I think I'll start there. Um, I I had a partner, and we started from a two man operation, grew it to eighty five employees, and uh, at the time, back in the early two thousands, we were doing about eighteen million a year. So it's not a small company. I uh, worked in four states. Um, what type of Dennis, what type of construction was it? Well, uh, commercial and institutional, but I built a lot of schools. Uh, we lived in the area of the state where there are a fair amount of small hospitals. So I did a fair amount of work, uh, renovations and, and the reason the way I got hooked up with, uh, healthcare, uh, we, we were a minor partner with Mortensen on a $44 million tower in our hometown. And we provided- you're in, you're in Kansas, correct? That's correct. And uh, we provided uh, some supervision, leadership, office staffing, and labor as need be on the project. And I, I really got to know the chief operating officer of the hospital quite well. And uh, uh, my partner and I, after 30 years, you know, and this just happens, we philosophically went different ways. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I hated to leave. I'm, I'm like a seven generation builder. Uh, wow. I've got a, a copy of a guild card from one of my six great grandfather Smiths in, in England. Wow. But, you know, I mean, there's a time for everything. So yeah. <clears throat> I left that company and went to work for the local hospital as a facility manager. I thought, you know, I built these things. I ought to be able to run them. <laughs> and that is a uh, that's far from the truth yeah. um, what helped well, concurrent with my um, construction career I had a National Guard career and I a 24 year career I was a battery commander and a, and a battalion commander of a, uh 8 inch self propelled nuclear unit hmm. we actually had um responsibilities for an area in Europe that we had a full a battalion set of equipment in Europe so that in an emergency, you know, when we say the balloon went up, uh, they'd pick up all of our personnel and move us uh, quickly. And we'd become a round out battalion to uh, to a brigade in, in, in Germany. So I had that, retired out of that as Lieutenant Colonel. I had my construction career. All of those are male-dominated uh, businesses. And when I got into healthcare, it's it's probably ninety percent female. You know, nursing staff. My boss was a was a female, great woman, and uh, she was a Air Force um, veteran, a nurse in the Air Force. So we had some common language there, but. What I learned, uh, I knew a lot of the physical attributes of this whole hospital operations, but 
the um, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that goes on in those places that uh, I didn't know. Uh, and, and part of it, probably the big part of it was coming from a male dominated world, I was very direct and and uh, it didn't take me long to learn that I had to uh, be very thoughtful about how I interacted with the staff because, um, you know, it was very easy to uh, miscommunicate. Sure. Um, Leanne Ersick, uh, my chief operating officer, man, she was great. She said, I want you to get involved in ASHI. Uh, I did. And I'm going to tell you that it was the best experience that a anybody that goes into this facility business could possibly have. I learned so much. I got my CHFM. I met Skip Smith. Um, after uh, During the time at the hospital, I finished my master's degree in management and um, moved on to uh, Catholic Health Initiatives, which is now Covenant Health. And Skip was my boss. Um, he uh, he gave me a kind of a complicated job. He said, Smith, he says, I want you to nationalize our staff across 100 hospitals in the United States. What year is this, Dennis? Uh, that was 2006. Okay. And uh, in 2012, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you do the math, that's six years. Yes. Uh, it took me six years to develop enough data Um to be able to convince hospital administrators that it was in their best interest to give up control of their facilities. Hmm. And, but, you know, once, once we begin to centralize a lot of things, the energy piece of it, uh, you know, the first full year that we, we were able to do that, we, we dropped about $18 million out of our um, operations budget, hmm. which, you know, for a cup for a 17 or 18 billion dollar company is kind of budget dust but uh i felt pretty good about it right right and, you get a uh, lot for 18 mil <laughs> yeah, well, you know you can and so that uh that time i spent with skip was very informative i scanda came to work for us during that time scanda scanda Revol, the current president of ashi just had a conversation with Skanda. So yes, yep. Had a terrific team. I, I mean, a terrific team, and I, I felt so blessed to be able to, uh, to even be in the same room with those guys. Yeah, there was a yeah. lot of great, a lot of great talent that came out of Catholic Health Initiatives before, you know, before the, the merge and and the reorgs and everything. Yeah, the the whole nationalization and and uh, consolidating the uh, operations of the facilities, um, I I I don't know if it's um, common across the the country. I don't think so. Uh, worked a little bit with Brian Weldy and HCA. You know, we would meet and do some common talk about common issues, and uh, they were real good on the manage on the energy side but they didn't really have the the management staff that belonged to them so i don't know how much of that is really done across the country right now to tell you the truth yeah i agree i mean i didn't i've been out you know i've been on the consulting side for 10 years now but you know the organization i was working for we tried to do i think a lot of organizations they come together with okay we're going to standardize right we're going to we're going to create these efficiencies and it's easy to say but as you know because you've done it I mean, it was easy for us to say that, but then you're dealing with with hospitals in different parts of the country, which means they're different dealing with different, even something like different climates, the difference between snow and rain and, and outsourcing that. So I think it's easy to say, but then there's all those intricate details and in the, you know, the paint store on the corner where I've gone to yeah. for so many years and he can put me on credit. So it's very easy to say, but in actuality, how many are doing it? You're probably right. <laughs> Yeah, and doing it, it, it well, it, right? Doing it well, that's the key. It's a tough deal. Yeah. And, um, you know, we created a system with regional managers, and then uh, they would take a portion of the, an area of the country, uh, because you're right, in the Northwest, in Oregon and Washington, our staff were unionized. Mm. So that changes everything. Yeah. Um, 
So we had an area manager over there and we had area managers or division managers, depending on what, where they were. And, uh, and then we were, we had, at the time we had a facility one and a facility two designation and a facility. And I, if I remember right, the facility one was, uh, more of an entry level and a facility two is might have responsibility for a couple of hospitals, you know, but we were able to thin out our overhead when we did that whole thing. And it was, uh, it was a, a significant deal. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, so I imagine you have taken the experiences that you have just articulated some of that you've rolled into your yeah. into your book the velvet glove of glove why do i keep saying glove velvet glove <laughs> if i had it to do over again i might change the title i don't know <laughs> oh really oh, it is a little it's a mouthful <laughs> yes yeah I like, <clears throat> I like it so tell us dennis what's the book about well um i i was talking to actually scanda and we were I, I can't remember what the topic was and and he made a comment about um, it was challenging for um, for the new hires, the Gen Zs, to bring in and, and integrate them. And I, I thought, well, that's an interesting comment. And then as time went on, I, I take the read the Wall Street Journal every day, and uh, I start seeing articles about how current graduates didn't know how to uh, work in an office. Um, the type of issues that they were dealing with. Last night, I heard that, uh, on, a, on one news station that um, Gen Z, when they, some of them, when they go for an interview, they take their parents. You're kidding me. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is hearsay. You know, I saw it on the <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, uh, I, I would tend to believe it now. Yeah. I, yeah. Unfortunately, I, you're <laughs> I have to be very, very careful and I, I don't want to class a whole generation as everybody does this. And mm -hmm. so I don't want that to come across. But um, here's what happened. Um, in 2007, January the 9th of 2007, okay. the, first, the first iPhone was uh, set up for sale. So... Seven, so 17 years, 17 years ago, 17 years ago. And if you, you know, for all of us, I was surprised because I thought, well, gee, it must have been back way in the 90s when the, yeah. you know, I did have a cell phone in the 90s, but it was a little flip phone. It was an right. Android. Uh, I would love to go back to the flip phone to be quite honest with you. you got there, right. Yeah. Uh, I find myself, you know, surfing that phone more than I really want to, but. My grandson was born in 2007. He has never lived without an iPhone. Yeah. And I, I watched the kids he was around. And I think he's done pretty good managing that deal. But I would see him with, you know, walking down the street with other kids and they'd have a phone in their hand. They wouldn't even stick it in their pocket. They had to have it instantly so they could do that instant thing. So that that changes a lot. And then uh, in 2019, 2020, uh, depending on what part of the country you were in, when COVID hit, it wiped out uh, after school groups, it wiped out church groups, it wiped out Boy Scouts, it wiped out in school education, all of those things. Well, and, and after school work. Yeah. Um, I live in a very little town and the grocery store here continued to hire and, and use kids during that time. But I'm going to tell you, there's probably places across, across the country that after school work was gone. Yeah. So that left this gigantic hole uh, in, during a very sensitive developmental period. And I thought, Okay, I've heard I've heard from people I respect that they're having issues. I read it in the paper and I thought, what does that what does that really mean? So I I went to my bookshelf. I have probably about four feet of books from the master's degree, and I pulled those out and I started looking at them again. I started reading you know uh, articles on on the issues that people were dealing with. And I, I thought to myself, 
you know, so what, what's really different and what's not different. And, and quite frankly, I think that those principles of leadership are the same. Hmm. But everything has changed. And um, unfortunately, and I don't know where this is going to lead the country. I really don't. I, I'm scared to death for my own grandkids. But, you know, as a nation, um, where's the leadership going to be if if they can't uh, drag, you know, create a, an email all the way through instead of using text, that by the way, when they use text, they use all these shortcuts. <laughs> so there's not even real language. <laughs> so in, in a hospital setting, how do you convey the uh, seriousness of event you know, text is great. I mean, I, I'm not saying don't use text. Sure. Yeah, everything's got a time and a place, right? It's got a time and a place, but um, you've got to be able to communicate when things go wrong, and they will go wrong in a hospital setting, and um, and get things done. And unless you're very deliberate and intentional and understand that type of thing, you know, uh, one of the one of the things. Uh, you know, one of the questions I, I think you were asking earlier was, uh, what's the most important thing about leadership? And, and I kind of tangentially talk about it in my book. I, I talk about four um, heroes. Uh, or what, Dennis? He, heroes. People oh, heroes. That, yeah, that you would look up to. My personal uh, historical hero is Chamberlain. And uh, Neville Chamberlain? Neville? Oh, Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain. Okay. I was going, was going, I was going to Neville, Neville first, and then I would just Neville. say Joshua. So. <laughs> I was going to ask he, you why Neville. But... No, not Neville, but okay. Joshua Chamberlain, you know, he actually left his job as a professor in Maine and commanded uh, a Maine unit at the Civil War uh, battle in Gettysburg. And they arrived at, at his position about 10 minutes before the first attack from the confederate side not very long and they said uh, chamberlain they said you need to protect little round top because it's our flank and if they if the flank falls then the enemy can come right up the side and take out the whole union army and so chamberlain went through uh, he got his people his men positioned he had some deserters that he was given control of and, and they didn't want to be there so he put them over by themselves and he put his his soldiers down and and the rebels attacked up the up the hill and uh, they were his soldiers were behind rocks and they were able to repulse him but he lost you know part of his part of his contingent that happened again <clears throat> and it happened again but the last time it happened they only had three rounds of ammunition each and they lost about oh i don't know a third of their soldiers and he he got the uh, the re the um, deserters gave him weapons, and he stood up in the middle of that charge up the hill where the in, where the Confederates were charging up the hill. He stood up, and he said, "Fix bayonets." And he he got his soldiers on their feet, and he said, "Charge!" And they charged down the hill, and they they broke that third and final attack but what kind of integrity what kind of courage is that and if a person doesn't have that hero hmm. they if they don't have that historical piece somebody that they can look at and I, and I hope they have a somebody that personally they call a hero too but I think those historic I, I had Rosa Parks in the book I talked about her I talked about uh, Mother Teresa um I'm trying to think of who the fourth one was. I give four good examples and two bad examples. But, you know, kind of from the back door, I come in and I say, you know, you need to think of this integrity piece. Without that, nothing else matters. Mm. And then the, probably number two is uh, communications. You can have all the integrity. You can have all the knowledge. But if you can't communicate that, so that it's useful it's doesn't mean much yeah 
so did you so i'm just trying to think of um you know going back to you formulating your book so did the, the did the did this idea come to you 20 20 20 20 i'm sure you know ideas just don't pop they kind of grow like you know you're gardening and then one day something comes to fruition but so were you kind of thinking over these issues listening to people i guess i'm getting in your mind how did that process work and and you, you know did you come to that okay it's it's leadership based and i get to you know i need to articulate that and 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 talk about leadership and how it's lacking for lack of a better i mean you know you yeah. talked about texting and one thing i i've heard from folks i work with in healthcare facilities that there are some of their leadership they report to that only want them to communicate via texting yeah. which is like you said in in healthcare in any walk of life you can't distill life to a text <laughs> it, it's so sterile yeah. No, I, you know, during the, I, I really attempted to understand the whole pandemic era. And, um, you know, I just, like I say, I started hearing things and seeing things in probably 2019, 2020. Uh, and that bubbled to the surface in October of 2022. And that's when uh, I talked to my wife and I said, you know, here's what I'm thinking about. And uh, she said, you should write a book. Uh, she was very sorry she said that later on. <laughs> I, I started in October of 2022. Okay. Uh, you know, I was so, I thought the idea was so great that I was, I should, uh, I looked around my office and I thought, you know, you need to preserve this room so they can come in and see where the book was written, just like Shakespeare, Shakespeare's <laughs> house in, in Europe, England. Um, well, that was a high point. <laughs> and after I actually started writing, it, you know, that became drudgery. And uh, I talked to a publisher and I said, how how big a book should it be? You know, because this is, I've got, like I say, three or four feet of books that I had to condense somehow. And, and the publisher, Dorrance, said, if it's more than 100 pages, nobody's going to read it. And, and that's a pretty darn sad commentary. I'm actually at 122 pages, but it, it's it's. Uh, I wrote it such that I think you can pick it up in an airport in Boston, and by the time you land in Chicago, you'll be done with it. Um, <clears throat> and I had to write it differently. Uh, I, I thought about how kids, how people, anybody really, mm -hmm. and that's your phone. audience, right? Any, I mean, anybody yeah. is your audience. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I've gotten comments from uh, other senior people that said, oh, I've forgotten about that. And uh, so I, I, I thought about how people use their phones and they have come to that blue text, you know, the hypertext, and they'll click on that and they'll go someplace else. So I, I identified um, 16 arts, the things that um, are a little harder to learn. And then uh some more sciences the actual mechanics of you have to do this you have to do that and within each one of those it only covers a few pages it only covers probably 20 pages for those 16 items which are really big yeah but embedded in those and you've seen it i think if you looked at the book or go to page number whatever yeah and there's a, a second part of this it's a it's a toolbox probably less than 100 pages not much of a toolbox but it's kind of like the one I started out with the carpenter, you know, the basics. And uh, and you can, if you go to that page number reference, you'll go to a topic that you can learn more. And, but even even beyond that, I uh, created a YouTube channel and I put a QR code in the book so that if you want to even learn more, that you can do that. But some of these topics are huge. Um, I... My construction company, I actually uh, won the uh, Level 1 Baldridge Award for Kansas in 1996, 97. Now, you probably remember the Baldridge Award, you, but, you know, it's kind of fallen out of favor. But that's, uh, that's where you have to get all these processes put together and in place. And, and I, I really became a, a student of total quality management during that time. You know, Six Sigma, all that kind of thing. How much of that do you hear about nowadays? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now you're on an airplane 
and you get to 16,000 feet and you're sitting right next to where the door used to be and boom, there's a big hole. And I really think that's because we've forgotten the, these basics. Mm. Why, so, do you think, why do you think, Dennis, that we've forgotten the basics or moved away from the basics? I mean, heck, we're, you know, this is going to come out in a couple of weeks, but as you and I are discussing over the last week, we've had, like you said, just we've had two incidents on airlines with bolts and things blowing open and it doesn't seem to be going, it doesn't seem to be improving. What has led to this, do you think? Well, we've taken our eye off the ball. The second thing is it's hard. And let's take TQM, for example. Um, Deming was a, he was only one of a number of people. Bell Labs back in the 30s developed this total quality management where you go in and you, and you do your work and then you, you have a plan and you do the work and then you check the work to make sure it is actually good. And then you adjusted the plan, uh, plan, do, check and act. PDCA is what I call it. There's another, there's other terms that I, I use in the book too that other individuals that use differently. But it's hard. Hmm. And Japan embraced this after World War II because they were reduced to nothing. They had no manufacturing, they had nothing. And Deming and the United States said, we 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 can't afford to have. Uh, this country weak because it's it's a vacuum that's going to fill up and it's not going to be good. And we worked to reestablish the uh, manufacturing and the government. We wrote their constitution in Japan, all that sort of thing. But Deming went there and he talked to them about this is how you do it. These are the steps you go through to be successful and you plan and you do and you check and you act. And you just do that over and over again. And they embraced it. And now, what's the most popular car in the world? Mm -hmm. Toyota. You know, there's more Toyotas on the street than, uh, and they're old. The yeah, old Toyotas are still, still running. Yeah. And uh, it got to the point <laughs> when when Deming was on the street, people would bow to him, you know, because they knew that he had given them the tool to save them. And but the trouble is, they had to go through a world war and be reduced to nothing to want to climb out of it. Yeah. So I watched um, I watched an interview that you gave to Good Day Kansas Morning Show. But you said, you know, during your discussions, when you were talking about writing the book, your discussion with current leaders, they would comment to you that employees are technically competent, but the interpersonal skills are missing. So I guess you know, can you expound on that a little bit? What interper and we've talked in general around it, but what interpersonal skills do you feel are missing, and how does your book assist in trying to compensate for that, or or to you know train for those missing skills? The the big one I think, like I said before, is is, is communication, and uh, um, you know people. People listen for two reasons. Third, if you ask my wife, you know, I'll be sitting here and out of the blue, she'll say, you don't listen to me. <laughs> so, that, so that's number three. <laughs> but uh, the other two, and, and I don't specifically say this in the book, but it kind of works around this whole thing. People, people listen for two reasons. They listen to respond. And all the time they're listening, they're formulating in their mind, Oh, oh, this is how I'm going to argue with this person, or this is what I'm going to say to them. And they they listen to understand. And that they're two different things. Because when you listen to understand, you ask questions. Well, well why do you think that way? Um, uh, Deming, you know, he says, you got to ask why five times, because it takes that much to get down to the real reason. So um, you... And, and I talk about that. I talk about active listening. And if if people will work on that, I mean, I can describe it to them. I can I can give them more information about everything else. They have to choose to to do this. But if they can get to the point where they actively listen, not necessarily to respond, but to understand, then that is a huge step. 
Um, so, you know, I have things like that, uh, different topics like that through the book. Uh, there's no way to make somebody expert in 120 pages. It isn't going to happen. But yeah, uh, Aristotle said, if you know yourself, that's the beginning of knowledge. And I'm not Aristotle. <laughs> but I had a friend that, I, but, you know, I, I thought I was there for a little while right at the beginning of the book. But, um, you know, that office I was going to preserve for tours in the future. Yes. Uh, I need to get a 10-yard dumpster here and, and uh, start cleaning it out. It's got so much paper and empty ink cartridges in it. This concludes episode one. Please return to the Healthcare Facilities Network in the near future to view episode two. And as always, thank you for watching.